friend of mine, George Diaz, who texted me to the kids at the Lenox Street Housing Development are dependent upon you to be elected mayor of the city of Boston. And I took that text literally that night because I knew the state of Lenox Street at the time. There was no community center there for the kids. And I also understood that the challenges those young people face and that their future uh, wasn't as bright as it should be. For the last four years, my job as mayor has had them in the back of my head the entire time. When we talk about creating opportunities for housing and making sure that every Bostonian has an opportunity for housing, those kids are in my head. When it comes to opportunities for education, thinking about how they get a good, strong start in life is by making sure that they have a good, strong education in their neighborhoods. Also, making sure that as they get older, they have a good summer job to be able to work in the summertime and build relationship with. I also making sure that there's economic development opportunities for those kids when they graduate college and when they, when they move on to the workforce to make sure that they can survive and, and be, be strong in the city. That's what this city's about. This city's about hopes and dreams. And four years ago, when I got on that stage, when I got elected mayor of Boston, I kept that promise to those kids and I can continue to this day to keep that promise to those kids. And in the next four years, we're going to continue to strengthen Boston together because we need to make sure that Boston is for all of us. That's right. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm running for mayor to become the next mayor of Boston because Marty Walsh has made promises that he did not keep and because he has forgotten the people that I represent and all of those good people in the city who are committed to creating a more equitable and fair city of Boston. So you say to me, Tito, what have you done in the past six years as city councilor? Well, I've stepped up to close the gap and failed leadership in the city of Boston. I led when the Olympics were gonna to come to town and bankrupt the city of Boston. I have fought gentrification by helping form an organization called Reclaim Roxbury to ensure that we protect people who are being pushed out of the city of Boston every single day at the fastest rates that we have ever seen in the city of Boston. When question two was threatening our community, with question two was gonna suck all of the money out of the Boston public schools, as well as public charter schools, as well as parochial schools, I stepped forward and took a leadership role statewide, while uh, Mayor Walsh did not step forward and actually only endorsed it at the very end. I led on immigration. Uh, I stepped forward and said that we should be a sanctuary city from day one, uh, while my opponent uh, did it when it was politically expedient. Oh, that's right. I led when it came to an immigrant legal defense fund, and I filed it in February, and I'm glad uh, to say that Mayor Walsh has now finally joined uh, and has actually created a legal dis defense right. fund. And I have led on the Boston City Council to ensure that body-worn cameras, body cameras on every single Boston Police Department. No need to study it anymore, ladies and gentlemen. When I'm mayor, I will ensure that we implement this. As mayor of the city of Boston, uh, and actually as a city councilor, I have shown courageous leadership. And as mayor, I will show that same courageous leadership. Thank you so much. Take a second and explain the format, which is that uh, there will be questions asked of each of the candidates. They will have a minute and 45 seconds to respond to that question, and then their opponent will have 45 seconds to respond. Again, by coin toss, the first question goes to Councilor Jackson. Councilor, the public is often assured that compared to other places, Boston is a safe city. But there are neighborhoods, including this one, where shootings and other forms of violence remain a persistent problem. What can the city do to make Boston safe for all its residents? Well, we could make sure that a life lost on Blue Hill Ave means the same as a life lost on Commonwealth Ave. In the city of Boston. Several things that we can specifically do, and I propose uh, the Richmond model in the city of Boston. Uh, that would be engaging young men who are not at risk, but these are proven risk young men, engaging them with school, engaging them with work opportunities. And in Richmond, uh, that's in California, they were able to close the gap and ensure that there were 74% less shootings uh, in uh, Richmond, California. In addition, I would make sure that we would have a more diverse police department in the city of Boston. Under the <laughs> 75% of the new police officers hired are, are white. 
Uh, and uh, under uh, Mayor Walsh, 90% of the new firefighters hired are white. We need a police department and public, ser public servants who look like uh, the people in the city of Boston. In addition, it is critical that we work uh, to ensure that our young people have things to do. I would ensure that we have 5,000 new summer youth jobs and 1,000 new uh, jobs that are for year-round uh, in the city of Boston. I will also reopen the Grove Hall Community Center, which was closed Woo! under Mayor Walsh. Sadly, after uh, actually two months after someone died in front of that youth center. And I will also deal with the fact that the city of Boston currently has a 4% arrest rate for non-fatal shootings in the city of Boston. That is unacceptable, and we need to make sure that we roll our sleeves up and solve crimes in the city of Boston. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. One of the, one of the things that, that I do consistently is the first thing I do every morning is stop my phone day with a phone call from Commissioner Evans or Chief Willie Gross to talk about what happened in the city of Boston the night before. Uh, certainly, it's one of the things that keeps me up at night, the safety of our city. And when I think about the safety of our city, I think of it in two ways. One is I can get into the stats about shootings, and I can get into the stats about clearance rates. And the clearance rates for this year for non-fatal shootings are up 21%, and the clearance rates for homicides this year are up to 61%. But that's not going to solve the problem. There's still too many mothers being notified their kids are being killed. So what we want to do is continue to work and create programs and opportunities to make sure that we strengthen our relationships in our neighborhood. One is through our Office of Returning Citizens and Kevin Sidley, our new director's here with us tonight, to Operation Exit and Program. <laughs> a clarification on the roast, I thought it was a minute 45, a minute 45, and 45 and 45. That was what explained to me. For, for the, I just didn't know. Okay, so it's... Okay, that was a minute 45? Yes. Oh, I thought, oh, okay, I was missing, I'm missing, oh, I'm sorry, now I got the rules down. I'll start, can I start over again? All right, now I got it, sorry. Mayor Walsh, the second question is to you. Currently, the police department is conducting a pilot program for body cameras. Should that program become permanent? Actually, thank you very much for that. Um, actually, our, our pilot program is, is not no longer in uh, a study. What we're looking at now is we're taking the information, the data from the pilot program to see if we're in, when, and how we use body cameras. And I think that that's something that we're going to make a decision on over the course of the next couple of months here in the city of Boston. But what's, in, what's important here is not just about a, a device on somebody's shoulder. It's about how do we continue to build trust in our communities. And that's what we do every single day, working with our communities to build trust. Now, you heard earlier stats about the Boston Police Department. We currently have 130 officers in the academy right now. 49% of those are officers of color. We created a cadet program in the city of Boston, of which 69% of those are kids of color. So it's about building up the trust in the community and also diversifying the command staff so that we can build trust in the neighborhood. We have found too, too many shootings in our city, and we have too many questions why this is happening. Why it's happening is because kids don't have opportunities. We need to make sure young people and older people, quite honestly, it's not all kids, have opportunities to advance in life. And that's what we're going to do, continue to work in job training programs. So simply to say, is the body camera the right thing or the wrong thing to do? That will be decided in the next couple months. But what I do know, it's about building trust and creating opportunities for people in neighborhoods. Um, uh, in fact, uh, I don't believe that we needed a body, uh, a body camera pilot program in the city of Boston. We simply should have adopted body cameras. The Boston Police Department uh, actually does not even have uh, cameras in the vehicles. So there should be no question, we are not first in the country to adopt body cameras. It is critical that there's a relationship. And also, let, let me speak to my friends who are police officers. This helps you too. This absolutely helps you and provides for accountability on both sides of the camera. The in police addition aren't to the, the body-worn cameras, I will also note that I would actually put forward a civilian review board that actually has teeth. Yeah. Yeah. So we can what actually happens in and around our neighborhoods and communities and their interactions. The third question goes to Councilor Jackson. How, 
how can you create more interaction between citizens and the police department? And specifically, how can you make it easier for citizens in real time to give feedback about the police? As I, as I just noted, um, I believe it is unacceptable uh, to have a board that is currently sitting that actually said it should be dissolved. So the current civilian review board said that they should dissolve it, the people who are currently on it. We need to have a civilian review board that actually has teeth, one that has subpoena power, and one that actually builds trust with neighborhoods and communities. And so that is a critical component uh, that we have that level of transparency uh, and accountability to ensure that we have the relationships. Because the reason why people are not coming forward are based on the fact that there is a breakdown in the relationships that they have with the police department. That is a critical component, and in my administration, we will make sure that we focus on community policing. We will make sure that we uh, expand uh, the number of police officers. And, and I want to go back to safe street teams, where we have police officers assigned on individual, in individual areas, two or three of them in a specific area. And we saw a great deal of crime reduction in those areas. That personal interaction and the community policing actually does work. And as mayor of the city of Boston, I will ensure that there's more of that. Mayor Ross. The way that you build trust with community is by notifying and giving them information. Uh, we started the summer this summer with sitting down with clergy and community leaders to talk about our program for the summer. We did peace walks in our neighborhoods. Those, those work in our neighborhoods. We have peace walks in East Boston and Roxbury and Dorchester and all, throughout the entire city of Boston. That's something that's really, really important for us to do. When it comes to the co-op board, the co-op board was given instructions last year to go back and take a look and review and see, come back with some changes. And what the co-op board came back with was two changes, two big changes. One was to extend the co-op board from five, three members to five members and to increase their caseload by, by 20. And also, if you look at Boston, if you look at the crimes against police officers, violations against police officers, we're down half 50%, and excessive force is down from 40 to 16 incidents last year. So we, we're going to continue to work on this every single day, and that's something that we do every single day, work at the relationships that we have in our city. Mayor Walsh, one big uh, issue in the city in terms of public safety and in, that's important to the coalition that's sponsoring this debate is bike safety. What can be done over the next four years to make the city safer for people who travel by bike? Yeah, one of the things we have to, well, first of all, Boston, is, Boston has done some incredible things on bikes, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, not all people have embraced bikes in the city of Boston. Depending on what hall you go into, some people love bicyclists and other people say, well, they shouldn't be on the street. The streets in Boston are for everybody. They're for bicyclists, they're for pedestrians, and they're for cars. And what we have to do, we launched a program called Vision Zero. And our Vision Zero program is to get the zero fatalities and zero serious incidents by the year 2030. What we have to do is continue to build infrastructure in and around our city to make sure that our bicycles can coexist on the same streets as our automobiles and the pedestrians. We're doing that in certain parts of our city right now. We're doing it in Connecticut Story of Boston. We're doing it in the Back Bay or down, down, down on Commonwealth Avenue. And we're working to make sure we ensure opportunities for bikes. We're also expanding our ride sharing programs. And we're also expanding programs for people to be able to park their bikes. In City Hall, behind Ranks of Wide Park, uh, we have about 35 bikes a day that people drive them right into Boston. So we have to continue to work and educate drivers and educate pedestrians on how we have better bike safety. We are underfunding bike infrastructure in the city of Boston. Uh, in Boston, we spend $5 per person per, uh, in, in bike infrastructure. In New York, they spend $15 per person in bike infrastructure. And in San Francisco, they spend $75 uh, per person in bike infrastructure. Nobody should die in the city of Boston based on lack of bike infrastructure. And it is critical that we increase uh, the amount that we put in our bike infrastructure. We have a parking meter fund. Every time you spend uh, money, and I, I know a little bit about this, um, and it, it goes into uh, the parking meter fund. Uh, we should be using those dollars as well as other dollars to ensure that we increase bike infrastructure. And understand, safe bike infrastructure is also good for pedestrians. We've seen an increase in pedestrian uh, accidents in the city of Boston also. Thank you so much. It's time to move to our second topic, which is economic development. The first question on this topic goes to Councilor Jackson. Economic development obviously is a huge issue across the city and in this neighborhood in particular. What changes should be made in city policy to include neighborhood residents in the planning, construction, and development 
for projects in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan? Well, the first thing that we should do uh, to make sure that that occurs is we should dismantle the Boston Redevelopment Authority. <laughs> We should take away the urban renewal powers and we should put forward a people-focused, human-centered uh, planning organization that is professional and that actually looks out and listens to neighborhoods and communities. We also need to ensure, and day one, I will do a disparity study because I, we all know that there's a huge disparity in terms of access to uh, jobs, not only jobs, but also contracts. In the city of Boston, we spend $2 billion annually in contracts, and less than 2% go to people of color, and less than 0.5% in this administration goes to black-owned businesses. That is absolutely wholly unacceptable, and as mayor of the city of Boston, I will turn that train around and ensure that businesses owned by people of color, businesses owned by women, businesses owned by veterans, and businesses owned by uh, local businesses will have an opportunity to do business with the city of Boston. Our dollars should be used to uplift all, not only some. Mayor Walsh, how do we increase diversity and development? Our economic plan depends upon growth without displacement and building wealth. That's what we want to do. In the last three and a half years, we've had incredible growth in the city of Boston. We've added 60,000 new jobs to our city. Our unemployment rate in Boston is 3.4%. However, in areas of Georgetown, Roxbury, Mattapan, that unemployment rate goes from 6% down to about 4.5%. So we need to make sure that growth happens throughout every neighborhood. We've built 11, 12 million square feet of commercial space in the city of Boston. We're creating opportunities in every neighborhood. What we're starting to see in Roxbury now is investment being made in Roxbury. Not too far from this building, the Gascott building, they're talking about Roxbury investments and in building a tower that's gonna to bring wealth to this community. Building a building down the street wasn't enough. The building, the building down the street wasn't enough the school department. We need to make sure we, we have policies throughout the entire city that benefit everyone. Last thing I'll say, one of the, one of the things I did as mayor is raise the Boston Jobs Residence Policy numbers. From, from, 20, from 50, 25, and 10 to 51% Boston residents, 40% people of color, and 12% women. Mayor Walsh, the next question goes to you. The rising cost of living has priced many people out of this, who built this community out of it. How can Roxbury be preserved for the people who have built it as such a desirable place to live? Well, I think there's a few things that we have to do there. Number one, we've created, I know we're going to talk about housing in a little while, but we've created 9,000 units of low-income, moderate-income housing in the city of Boston to keep people in their neighborhoods. That's something that's, that's vitally important. But if people don't have a job, if people don't have a job, they can't afford to pay for their home. Can I finish the question? Please, please let the candidates answer the questions. 4,500 units have operated in the last two years for your answer. And we're working on also creating more opportunities for people of color and women by doing a, we did an executive order in the city of Boston to make sure people of color and women have more opportunities to get into contracting service in the city of Boston. Something that was reversed 16 years ago, never went back and never looked at, which we're able to do. And we're also working with our small business center because the majority of our businesses in Boston aren't the big businesses, they're the small businesses. They're the mom and pop stores on the corner of our street. And we're working with through economic development to make sure we give people the tools they need to move forward. Let me go back to housing for one second, because I don't know if it's gonna come up later today. When you look at loans from banks to the communities of color in the city of Boston, you're looking at 10%. That's a problem. We have to work with our banks to force them to open up their pocketbooks and give more money to people of color to be able to buy that first time home. Also, in the city of Boston, for our own home buyer program, our first time home buyer program, 60%.